Hello and welcome back everybody to episode 108 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Uh, welcome back. I'm still in uh, England here and I'm enjoying it. I've had to extend my stay because of uh, work opportunities and so it's been great. Uh, one thing when I work with my students here at St. Mary's, uh, a few of them have commented on what a resource the Dan John University, uh, the downloads and the articles section have been. Uh, many people like more than just do this. They like to know the how and the why. And I think that's kind of the strength of what we do. I'm a big fan of narrative. I, I don't just want to know, you know, do five sets of two. You know, I, I want to know why we do it. I want to know why you picked that exercise selection. And I want to know the mistakes you made in getting to where you are today. And I think that's one of the richness of the, of the site. Um, it's very inexpensive to join. Uh, hop in and, and join along. Our first question from Muhammad is, 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 is very good, and I like it because the solution is simple. Muhammad asks, I want to start the easy strength for the Olympic list program, and since I don't want to change the program and turn it into something ineffective or stupid, good point, uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on whether it's a good or bad idea to add the clean and press to the program. Would it be too much or, and too much stress on the body? If it works, how should I go about it? And if it doesn't, should I just not press at all for the duration of the program? Or can I grease the groove and do a couple reps here and there every hour or so throughout the day? You know, frankly, everything you said is pretty good. The grease the groove idea is very good. But having said that, you know, back in the, in the day, little Danny John once thought to himself, you know, if all he did was clean and press and squat snatch when he was this age, he'd be doing just fine. And you know, here we are this age, and it's still good advice. So listen, Muhammad, the thing I would do for you, uh, depending if you have a good clean and press, um, there's there's two options. One option, if you're just going to do a true clean and press program, uh, back the way we used to do it when I was younger, where you, you did a clean and press, you know, you did clean and press, you did clean and press, then I would just take, just substitute the clean and press, for the uh, clean and jerk and just try those numbers. You know, try it for a week or two and then just say, okay, that's not enough volume or yeah, uh, the load is just right. The other option is do the clean press, 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 press idea. Um, if you're to do that, I would slide over to the, uh, the more standard easy strength numbers. You know, maybe a day of two sets of five, a day of three sets of three, uh, a set of five, go heavier, a set of three, go heavier and do a double. Uh, with the heaviest load, and make sure you get that double. Don't miss, no misses. Um, and then, you know, frankly, you could repeat that on and on. You know, two sets of five, three sets of three, five, three, two, two sets of five, three sets of three, five, three, two, and then slowly just uh, oscillate your way up uh, to uh, to some wonderful things. In fact, you know, if, if, <laughs> I'd like to know how you do if you do that, because that, that makes a lot of good sense to me. Uh, it's a good question, Muhammad. I'd like to know how that goes for you, okay? Thank you. So we have a question from Brandon. He says, I heard you say you no longer take supplements on a recent podcast. Can you give a little more detail on what that means to do, to you? Yeah, Brandon, it means uh, I don't take supplements anymore. Uh, no pills or powder at all, or still taking fish oil, multivitamin, etc. So question number one. Um, so what I decided to do for fish oil is a very simple thing. I have dedicated uh, at least two or three meals a week to eating fish. Um, a couple weeks ago, I went to a delicious sushi place um, here in uh, in Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> I try to eat quality fish and chips, and as you can imagine, the word quality is important. Um, there's nothing wrong with quality fish oil. Um, it's just for me, I had kind of gotten to where I need to be in uh, the way my skin was. Um, you know, as you know, I had lost between, you know, 16 or 17 kilos since January 1st, um, you know, somewhere around 35 to 37, 38 pounds. So I feel pretty good about that. Uh, I don't like traveling with a lot of fish oil capsules because I don't know what happens when you fly, but it does seem like those are the those are the ones that kind of go a little bit ugh, a couple of days into it. Um, will I be back to supplements pretty soon? Oh, you know, it will be, uh, you know, uh, 
I, I love them. I am supplementing on this road trip with, um, oh, yeah, with uh, gut-powered immune uh, because I did get sick here, and it is a um, probiotic with some vitamins in it. So it's interesting. I say I don't do it, but if I can find something that complements uh, modern medicine, like I think that might with some of the pills. I got a little bit of uh, a stomach issue here when I got here. Uh, and I can tell you exactly what it was. I wasn't sure at first what it was. And then uh, I was at the cafeteria and I smelled some uh, tuna fish. And my body screamed at me, that's the issue. So I got ill on some bad tuna. Um, so there you go. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of Metamucil. Do you consider Metamucil a supplement? Uh, I like... Uh, that, that I take that hibernate formula and it's got a little hint of uh, melatonin, but it's mostly magnesium. And I like that on the road because it helps me sleep. So, but I've moved away from and, and my number one sub, sub, uh, supplement when I'm in Utah would be this uh, kimchi I get the, at the Korean market now. Is kimchi a supplement or it's a food? So I'm sliding more to food as supplements. But okay, second question. Ruck versus weighted vest. I walk my dog a lot. Well, good for you and good for your dog. And the distance is varying from 1.8K uh, to 5K throughout the day. Any thoughts if these walks become better with a vest or a ruck set? Oh, yeah, of course they become better. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be too fancy. Just, you know, a little bit of extra load in a backpack. I think especially when you walk a dog, <laughs> you might want a ruck because the dog doesn't take you uh, linear, uh, you know, it's kind of, um, if you weren't walking the dog, I would suggest putting weights in your hands and walking heavy hand style, but yeah, I, I think it, I mean, I wouldn't go crazy, uh, I would never go over 15 kilos if you're, I were you, 33 pounds, and I would err on something uh, lighter that you will use versus something heavier that you'll never use again. Common sense, I know, but it's a lesson we all had to learn. Thank you. We have a question from Paul. How would you go about training for fencing? Is there anything specific you would add to the program for that sport? Well, I would stay, I mean, I know nothing about fencing. Um, okay, I was, fencing jokes, just put, put them aside. Uh, but generally, uh, when I watch the sport, it does, the sport, it does seem to be very one-sided with the lunge. One thing I probably would do is I would, if, I would have my athletes probably practice, not all the time, but maybe even up to 10% of the time on the off side. And uh, the nice thing about that from a learning perspective is that you tend to learn a lot. You, you, the, le uh, the goof we call goofy and throwing, but you know, the, as, you're, as you try to retrain yourself on something simple with your, your goofy side, it reinforces everything on your normal side. That would be about it. I, I don't know if I'd, I'd be doing a lot of lunges and stuff like that because you're already getting such a, a lot. Um, it seems to be a very exacting sport. So, you know, doing a mass program might really hurt you over time, you know. Uh, that's all I can add. I don't know anything at all. Thank you. We have a question from Dakota. Many times you have expressed how the shoulder press is superior to the bench press. Uh, it's, yeah, boy, that you, you, you're making this into a, a moral question. I didn't, I don't, I don't think I've ever said that. I think that, well, I probably said it, but what I mean, if I, if you misunderstood me, Dakota, is that for most people, the, 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 the benefits of vertical pressing is better than horizontal. Uh, I've got two questions. Do you feel the same way about the pike press, handstand press ups and versus, uh, regular press ups? Uh, yeah, well, I tell you one thing, um, for hypertrophy work, oddly, the uh, those standing push-ups seem to really build people's shoulders up as good or better than uh, doing standing presses. So yeah, I, I, I'm getting uh, feedback from people who I didn't ask for feedback, uh, telling me that the handstand press-up and back squat is a, an amazing um, bulky routine. In Mass Main Simple, I recommend the bench press because it's written for American uh, football players, but I, I, I uh, in hindsight now, I wonder if I should have had handstand push-ups, press-ups. Question two, 
What is your opinion on the dive bomber push-up? Yeah, we used to do those. Um, most of the people I work with have jacked up shoulders already, so that's just one more. You know, you're, you're just one more rep from you know <laughs> shoulder surgery. So I don't. They're fine, and I understand why you would do them, but uh, I, I, I don't. I'm not a huge fan. Thanks. We have a question from Ryan. I used to be really into kettlebells, and he capitalized it, so he's serious. But now I'm older and my lower back hurts and feels weak. Now, are you going to blame the kettlebell? Are you going to blame your technique? Are you going to blame the kettlebell or your training program? Are you, who are you blaming here? Um, I'm reasonably confident a core building progression can get the bells back in my hands so I can do your 10,000 swing challenge at some point in the future. Any advice to get my core back on track so I can aggressively bell again. Yeah, I, I, one exercise, do it more than you think. The suitcase carry. Uh, that is a, a walk, a single hand carry. Uh, walking, uh, my friend Stu McGill looked into this and he, he told me the same thing. It is an amer amazing core balance, core stabil stabilizer. Um, you know, as I, I'm talking, I'm here at St. Mary's and of course, if you mention uh, and no matter what you say, you know, 35 people will chime in with opinions, but I really think that walking and suitcase carries are the two best things you can do for your back. So you got the bells, pick one up and go for a walk, go really, 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 really far, switch hands and come home. Repeat, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. Okay. Good question. Thank you. We have a question from Matthew. I've been doing most workouts at home for a while and use kettlebells almost exclusively for weight training. I've been trying to integrate more Olympic style lifts with the kettlebells or oh, with, huh? and I've been experimenting with the split jerk. So far, I feel like this is beneficial, but I wanted to pick your brains on a few things. Do you have any thoughts on the freedom of movement with going overhead with kettlebell versus a bar? How does that impact shoulder mobility, stability, and strength? Well, that's why I like the shoulder, the, the single arm kettlebell press. A lot of the people I work with, the bulk of the men I work with, have a, a bad shoulder. But the nice thing about the single is that you put all your mind in the one hand, you have two legs, you have one core, you have your whole body supporting that, that you know, that press. So you're you're using all your mind to have good technique with the one. It's a little bit safer. Uh, if something bad happens, you always have the other hand to help bring it down or pull it back into position. So that would be the big one for me. And that's why I'm such a big fan. Even if uh, I'm working with an Olympic lifter, I don't mind little periods of the year where they do press, 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 press with the single hand uh, uh, kettlebell press because, you know, you're going to be building some hypertrophy uh, and some, I even say, maybe... You're, you're, you're ensuring a healthier joint when you go into those big ballistics overhead. In the split landing, uh, is the split landing worth continuing to work on? I enjoy the athleticism of the dynamic movement, but I wonder if it's effective or necessary with lighter weight. I often think of your dislike of lunges. In what ways might the split landing be different or beneficial? Well, I mean, for a lot of us who are built the way I'm built, um, you know, basically as a thrower, I mean, my split jerk position is my throwing stance. So I've spent so many years in there. I just think it's natural for me. Um, my coach, Dave Turner, has asked me to move to the uh, that push jerk style for me. It's because he thinks that at my last meet, I, I looked at my technique and, you know, he's right. My my split jerk has, has just gone to the dustbin of history and I, I just I don't know where it is if you find it let me know um, is there benefits yeah and then I remember Dick Notmeyer used to have us do it the opposite leg sometimes and it was weird for a while there um, I got stalled doing jerks and then doing the opposite leg very quickly I jerk more with my wrong leg and you go figure um, yeah there's benefits that I, I uh, it, it is a little, and it's pretty simple, but unless you're going to be worried about being the world champion or not, uh, why don't you just stick with the push jerk if, if you have any questions at all, okay? And his last question is, 
Is this a useful exercise for someone squarely within quadrant three and is mostly working out for longevity? Okay, there, now, see, now there's a million dollar question. Uh, if you're doing, uh, if you just want to live for longevity, um, I would prefer you just did your overhead presses. Get your ballistic work with the snatch and get your uh, tonic work, your, your hypertrophy, your power work with the press. Snatch and press. Uh, I feel like, uh, as I said before, you know, little Danny John at age 14 thought the clean and press and the squat snatch is all you ever needed to do as an adult. And uh, that darn kid keeps proving me right. So there's an idea. Thank you. We have a question from Eli. Do you have any tips on how to find a doctor that meets your needs? I struggle to find someone that is interested in training, wants to help me continue training, and knows how to deal with meatheads like me. Well, that's a million dollar one. Uh, I'm lucky my my doctor, my doctors uh, know me. So my one doctor was my student, of course. So he knows my my aspirations, my history. I walk in and we talk about the same people. My other doctor I taught is children. And the reason I have, well, I, there's good things about both doctors. First, um, Dr. Henry is my age. So the two of us can talk candidly about, you know, age 64 problems. Uh, Dr. Brunetti is younger, but we can talk candidly about long-term athletic problems. Um, I heard a lesson years ago that you should find a doctor who's your age and grow old, your age and your old se your sex and grow old with them. Uh, I, th I still think that's pretty good advice. Um, it's tough. Uh, in the United States, it can be real tough because of medical coverage. Or lack of would be the correct answer. But uh, that was good advice, that idea of find someone who's your age. I, it really did help me with some things about two decades ago. I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a question from Chris Hoffer. I can hang in the bottom position, uh, in the bottom pull-up position, with no problem at all for up to 60 seconds. Not surprising, as it's part of my everyday warm-up mobility routine. Thank you for that tip. You're welcome. But can only manage about 10 seconds in the top pull-up position, okay? Before actually doing more hangs in the top pull-up position, what might be a good way of uh, developing strength in this particular position? Well, first off, you know, uh, because of physics and because of anatomy, this is a weaker position. And that's just the way it is. Um, you have to be active in the active hang, and path in 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 this this hang. You have to be. You can be passive, and that's that's just the way it goes. One thing I would recommend is don't push that ten second max much for a while. Maybe find a I don't know somewhere in your program to do five to ten, three to five second holds, sub 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 maximal, jump up. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, let go. And do that and grease the isometric groove over time. And give yourself maybe even a full, you know, maybe do that three times a week for two weeks. And then retest. And just see if that all you needed was the, the non-failure practice to get better at it. Uh, it seems to work miracles for a lot of people. You know, Christopher, that's a that's a question that comes up a lot, not on my podcast, but in my uh, when I do workshops, and we've actually been at workshops where we've had someone practice that in one day in real time, and well, yeah, I mean, you might be able to go from ten to twenty seconds in one day, just uh, teaching the nervous system this is what I want. That was fast. Hey, listen, that was episode 108 of the Dan John University podcast. So listen, if you have questions, uh, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, next time I meet with you, I'll probably be back in my office and my dog, Sirius Black, uh, either uh, groaning or, you know, releasing some wind. And uh, I look forward to that. Thank you so much.